Richard made a lot of promises to me that he did not keep, but he did keep one, and that would be that he would kill me. A forensic file update. Started with a pain in my eyes, and then a lymph node started to appear, swollen lymph nodes. The full battery of tests. Not only did she find out she was pregnant, but she found out that she was HIV positive. Janice's primary care physician at the time, Dr. Richard Schmidt. He said, Janice is a slut. She sleeps around, she's in the bars at night. Janice had her own theory as to how she became infected. She began relating a story to me how she had had this relationship with uh, Dr. Schmidt for a number of years and that she had recently found out that she had HIV and she felt that he was responsible for it. And welcome to the program. And a lot has happened since this case wrapped up more than 20 years ago. We have an update. I will speak to the lead investigator and the prosecutor who cracked this case wide open and eventually put Dr. Schmidt away for 50 years. I want you to watch this. Janice Trahan was working as a nurse when she met Dr. Schmidt. What attracted me to Richard was his intelligence, a very brilliant doctor. They soon started sleeping together, even though both of them were married to other people. The affair lasted 10 years. They even had a child together. His promise to her at that time was that as soon as I'm able, I'm going to leave my wife and children, and you and I will be married, and we can be together. Trahan divorced her husband, but Dr. Schmidt refused to leave his wife. Things started to go south when Trahan ended their relationship and began seeing other men. If you leave me, I'll fix you, I'll fix it, so that no man will want you. One night, Dr. Schmidt came to her house and gave her an injection. I never had an injection cause that much pain in my life. He told her it was a B12 supplement, then promptly left. A few months later, she developed flu-like symptoms and went to the doctor. Not only did she find out she was pregnant, but she found out that she was HIV positive. Joining me is our veteran team, including Deneen Manette, criminal investigator, Lisa Bloom, civil rights lawyer at the Bloom Firm and legal analyst for Avo.com, and Mark Iglar, traveling all the way from Florida, trial attorney at speaktomark.com, and I have Jim Kraft, the lead detective in the case against Dr. Smith. Now, Janice Trahan is still alive. This is 22 years after having been injected with the virus that causes AIDS, HIV. My producer spoke to her recently, and here is what she said. Quote, I deal daily with the harsh side effects of the medications and take one day at a time coping with my illnesses. By illnesses, she means HIV and hepatitis C. I've been, I'm un disabled, unable to work. I've been blessed in many ways, and Jerry and I just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. My husband, children, and grandchildren can be many reasons to live. And an update on Dr. Schmidt, he is serving a 50-year sentence. Last year, he was up for parole, and his parole was denied. Lisa, appropriate? Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. If there's ever someone who should never see the light of day outside of prison walls, it's this guy. Now, Mark, you're a defense attorney. Oh, no. I, mean, I knew it. I knew I shouldn't have come. Could you defend a guy like this? Okay, listen. The answer is yes. No, no. Not does he deserve a defense. Oh. Could you defend him? I would have some challenges. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, yeah, honestly, let, let's discuss this. I am a human being. I find what he did abhorrent. I think that anyone who injects someone with HIV but doesn't think that's quite enough doesn't just go to hell. By doing the hepatitis C, they get solitary confinement in hell. Yeah. You know? Now, that being said, I would challenge myself, as I do with all of my clients, to defend them zealously How would you because do the it? Constitution Come on. requires what do you it. Got? Well, Game the, yourself. Go well, ahead. The question is, <laughs> the question is, what is the evidence? In this case, I, hats off to these investigators. They did yeah. a phenomenal job. Well, let me talk to Jim. Janine, I want to hear your, because I, I want to talk to Janine about crazy relationships, because that's really what's under this. Is he's, yep. He was married. He's having a kid oh, with yeah. a nurse. It's, it's, it's oh, yeah. nuttiness all around. But, Jim, what was your reaction when she first told you that she suspected Dr. Schmidt had actually injected her with HIV? When I heard the, when I read the, the sort of the chyron for, this, for the episode, I thought, I impossible. I, I can't imagine a physician doing that. I, I thought the same thing. He was uh, very well respected in our community. Um, he, his patients, he had excellent uh, relationships with his patients. And the story just seemed too 
too far fetched beyond belief. When did you start to come around to Ms. Trahan's or Nurse Trahan's point of view? Well, we did a, a pretty thorough interview with her and, and obtained as many details as we can. We used some memory recall techniques to try and pinpoint a date of the injection because this is a year later that, that she's reporting. And as a result of that interview and after uh, reviewing the information that she gave us, we, we started to confirm the things that she told us different facts that she had furnished during her interview. It's, and, it's, it's uh, interesting, uh, Jim. They were, they were accurate. Yeah, and Jim, even the fact that it was in a particularly painful injection rang true for me because in order to be sure you're transmitting HIV, you basically have to do it in serum or blood, and it has to be a felt relatively large volume or you're just maybe not going to make the trans wow. can, transfer of the virus. Can you ask him what the defense was at trial? Because that wasn't revealed in the story. I'm Jim, curious what was what the defense? Argued. Well, you know what? I'm the, uh, the defense was that... Oh. He, he was at home that night and uh, said that he never left his home, that, well, that he that was, was at home. Of course, we had cell phone records showing a, a phone call he made to her, um, uh, which she said he did right before he arrived at her home. And so there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that just, you know, uh, tended to uh, uh, prove her story more than than his. And as I recall, there was a 20 minute gap yes. where his wife said, yes. well, he was home all night except for that 20 minutes I was in the bathtub, which right. I can't be sure about. And also, wasn't there a bit of slut shaming going on? A because bit. There was saw, a lot of it. We saw in the opening video just now where he says, oh, she slept around with a lot of men. I'm sure that's not a tactic, Mark. I no, ma'am. No, no, no. But, but, I, but I do want to talk to Deneen about the, the <laughs> interpersonal piece of this because that's there's already... When people, people need simple lives, right? When people leave simple lives and commit to their relationships right. and are, you know, not messing around on their partners, not having children while they're male, right. all the junk that went on here, you never know how, th how badly things are going to spin out. If I had a dollar for every case that I handle now and that I've handled in the past that has to do with a love triangle going bad, I would be rich. There's always <laughs> something that's going on. Either the, the jilted lover, the wife finds out, the husband finds out something. And this stuff always leads to something, some kind of a problem. Someone gets killed, someone gets run over by a car, something. Because it's, I call it the X factor. And if you don't solve for X, then you have no idea of knowing how somebody is going to react when someone Something blows up. Who can foresee line? this? In other words, you cheat on this, you know, you cheat on your lover, right. and then some doctor with a phenomenal reputation injects you with not just HIV, but hep C as well? Uh, and, Who could foresee and, that? And then the, the not, wife's... Not the first time, though. We had a, uh, when I was on Court TV, there's one of a, of a man who injected his own son with HIV. Uh, what? Mean, this is not the first case, unfortunately. But, but you just don't one... know where these things are going to go. You never know how they're going to end up when emotions get involved in situations like this. I, I think Denise is making a really important point. I'm supposed to know a little bit about mental health, but I see cases like this, and I go, what is yeah, up with human right. beings? I can't imagine how they get themselves in these situations. And that, that's why we all can't look away from these stories, and that's why we're revisiting them to get into the, the, the weeds of all this and try to tease it apart. So far, I, I still think there must have been much more going on between the two of them mm -hmm. than is reported in the forensic file cases in order for this degree of unraveling to occur. Next up, I've got the prosecutor from the case. We will hear uh, Mark Eiglarch take him on with some <laughs> cockamamie defense. One night, Janice Trahan awoke to find her ex-lover, Dr. Schmidt, standing over her, holding a syringe. He gave her the shot, telling her it was a vitamin B12 supplement. The injection was very painful. I never had an injection cause that much pain. Months later, she was diagnosed with HIV. She began relating a story to me how she had had this relationship with uh, Dr. Schmidt for a number of years and that she had recently found out that she had uh, AIDS. But where did he get the blood? HIV tainted blood is not the easiest thing on earth to obtain. And how did detectives link him to the crime? And Dr. Schmidt sentenced to 50 years for attempted murder after he had injected his ex-lover with HIV tainted blood. Back with Deneen, Lisa, and Mark. And I gotta say, Deneen, just the fact that this physician is involved with his patient, who is also his nurse, who is also his lover, right. who he is not married to, whom he has a child with, the layers of boundary violations, and I'm gonna use the word craziness in that relationship, is 
and 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 forget the ethical violations, which are stunning. It's a setup for trouble. See, and this is the thing. I, now, I'm gonna, probably going to get a lot of flack for this, but I think that there needs to be a contributory negligence standard in criminal law. And the reason I say that, what does that mean? is what mean? because it means that sometimes people have an assumption of the risk. And even though this guy is a, is a loser and a dog and he needs to be under the jail and all of that, the fact of the matter is, is that this was a man oh, she no. broke up with. Uh -oh. He had a oh, key to her house. Uh -oh. You are uh -oh. not going to blame no. her. You know what? Lisa, Listen. she's coming after you. How are you going to just have someone come in your house and give you a shot who's your ex? boyfriend who's threatened you yeah, and threatened oh, your yeah, friend. Yeah, and oh, and wow. He's a loser. He's, and Denise, he's, I don't steal your doctor. That. And he's steal still your, your doctor. doctor. Which is the part that so drives me out of my mind. you need to wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to get my shot from somebody well, else okay. and give me my house key back. Okay, yes, <laughs> but we're talking about consenting adults. Okay? I understand And it's, I think it's very easy to go on cable TV and say, I would never cheat and any cheaters should all go to prison for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and it's not but that then, hard. But wait, wait, let me make my point. you're done, you're done. But in the real world, people do cheat all the time. And they don't shoot each other up with HIV, right. right? That's not foreseen. But when the relationship was over, she should have got her house key back and said, "Stop giving me shots," and and taken care, taking care of, of herself. I got a comment on her. this criminal law he thing. He threatened everybody the else. The issue at trial life. is whether what he did meets the elements of the crime. Clearly, a jury found that. Stop there. What that. she Stop. did has nothing to do with what he did. Well, that's but, we're gonna, wait, I, hold on, hold on. I, I, I'm interested <laughs> in all that, Janine, but I want to go out to the actual prosecutor himself, Mike Har Harson. He is the prosecutor responsible for having put away Dr. Schmidt. Mike, did you initially believe Janice? And you hear all this conversation going on here where there's a little bit of, you know, wondering about the nature of their relationship. But we're, we're saying that all of that aside does not have anything to do with what this man did. Right. No, I agree with that. And um, I, I did initially believe her. Um, you know, the injection turned out it had been given in August of 94, I believe it was. And... Of course, the doctors didn't relay the information about her having contracted HIV until after the holidays. And so she didn't come see me until about mm, probably six, seven months after that. Uh, but I sat and listened to her, and uh, she was very compelling. I mean, she was a, a very straightforward witness, uh, very believable. And uh, so I listened very intently to what she had to say. It was a very strange situation. How about Dr. Schmidt? I mean, just the fact that he had a patient who was also his lover, who was also his nerve, who he had broken up from and he was still having a child with and still being her doctor. I mean, all that, that nonsense, shenanigans. I'll Sweet. use the word, shenanigans. <laughs> You're so judgmental. No. <laughs> yeah. What was well, he like? There obviously were a number of ethical violations on his part, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Um, I may point out just as an aside that when after he was arrested and he came over a bond hearing, uh, in the audience uh, at the bond hearing was not only his wife, but his new girlfriend. Oh, uh, who was my also God. Uh, oh. Wow. And, uh, it's, it, at, at, one, at one point in the case, uh, the, the nurse, the new girlfriend, uh, mysteriously ended up moving to Ohio or someplace up north for a while, and we ended up worked out and eventually, I think, got her back. But, uh, yes, yeah, wow. she... Uh, it, it was kind of a, a strange situation having the wife and the new girlfriend. And he admitted on the stand that he, in fact, was having an affair with uh, this new person uh, in front of his wife. This what, is what, embarrassing for my gender because there's always <laughs> women who take up with guys like this. Right. What, what do you make of this guy? Let's stay with him. What do you make of him? It's a pig. Uh, well, it, honestly, he was a very good doctor, but a very was egomaniacal, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't, those was, two uh, things very, don't, don't exist together in my world. I, I mean, just the fact that he had yeah. those horrible viol boundary violations with his patients is already making him not yeah. a good doctor. And by the way, sometimes when you're over gratifying to patients, they love the fact that you're so, uh, um, paternalistic and all that. But in fact, he may have been doing a bad job. They made patients don't often know when the doctor's doing a bad job. They just love the attention. Uh, I have a question. Well, right. Mr. Harson, mm -hmm. so typically in a criminal case, there's plea offers. So this guy got 50 years on the back end. What was the plea offer? If he had pled guilty, what would you have offered him? Uh, we were making no offer in that case yes, uh, because of the nature of the offense. Plus the yes, fact that his lawyer wouldn't have yeah. any, any prospect anyway. You know? So obviously they felt very confident in the case. Yeah, he the did. Over evidence was overwhelming. Let me get something from the audience. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Armand, and I've uh, worked in the HIV and AIDS prevention education field, and I still consult in the field. A lot of things are not adding up. The average window period for someone contracting HIV is between two and, and three months. Yeah. So a lot of these symptoms that they're saying that happened, I'm not saying the crime couldn't happen, but it's not adding up. Also, mm -hmm. this is a prime example of someone violating what we now know as a HIPAA law. They didn't have it back in 1994. Yeah. So I'm just really curious on 
How does she get these symptoms, the things that happen? And it's not adding up. From someone who works in the field and still yeah. consult, it's not adding up. Well, I, I agree. She talked about it, swollen lymph nodes and all this business, which she probably didn't have. They may have been hyperbole for the forensic files more than for the courtroom. But uh, be that as it may, I'll let the, the prosecutor answer that question if you do have a response. Well, I'll just say this. Um, she was able to uh, determine the date of the injection. Uh, and, and you understand when we first met, she, she told me a lot of these facts, but there was no evidence to support some of what she was saying. But through the course of the investigation, we found out a number of things that certainly corroborated uh, exactly what she said, uh, like the date of the offense. She couldn't remember it when she first met with me. Uh, but after Detective Kraft spoke to her for a while and told her, look, just go back and think of things that you did or remember around that time. Maybe something will prompt your, uh, your memory. And it just so happened that some time later, she remembered that the night of the injection uh, and so forth, she was going to go to the hospital for a while. Then she, it started, the pain started to ease, so she stayed. But the next day, she went to the hospital and indicated to some of her workers, co-workers, uh, that, look, if something happens, I just want to let you know that Dr. Schmidt came by and gave me an injection last night, and it was awfully painful. Oh, so so what she did was later on, when she came back, and she remembered that when she went back to work that day, that someone told her that one of her favorite patients had died the night before. Oh, so you could get that And so date. she went back and checked the records and found out that the man had died on, the, uh, I believe, the night of August the 4th. Got it. And that's how we were able to pinpoint the date. And then later, hit, later his medical records uh, that we found hidden in his office pinpointed the date or coincided exactly with that date as to when the uh, uh, HIV virus was withdrawn from one of his patients and also a blood sample from another lady uh, which contained the hepatitis C was drawn either that day or two days before. And so that all tied into it and so forth. I, I, it's a fascinating case. It's hard for me to believe, but uh, the, the facts are what the facts are.